Well, good morning. Welcome. If you're joining us from online, if you're here in the room, both of you, welcome. It's good to see you this morning. It's good to have you join us this morning. As, as Bo was talking about the faithfulness of God, and we just sang that song, I thought of Matthew chapter 12. At the end of the message this morning, we're just going to look at a couple verses from Matthew 12, but let me read to you in Matthew 12, beginning in verse 22. This isn't on the slides, guys, but I want to put this in in the beginning. Remind us, in light of the world that we're living in right now, just remind us, ground us, center us a little bit into what Jesus said. It says in Matthew 12, 22, then they brought him a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could both talk and see. All the people were astonished, and they said, could this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, it is only by Satan that this fellow drives out demons. Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, now, he had just healed this guy. And the religious leaders of the day, they come to him and they say, hey, it's only by Satan that you drive out these demons. Well, on the face of it, it doesn't make a lot of sense because they're Satan's demons. But worse than that, he's coming in the power of God, and they're attributing his work to the power of Satan. So here's what Jesus says to them. Every kingdom divided, divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. And then he says in verse 28, but, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. They were looking for the kingdom. They were looking for the Messiah to come. And he says, if it's by the Spirit of God that I drive out this demon, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And it was by the Spirit of God. And the kingdom of God had come upon them. Jesus, the king, was there. Now, if you know Jesus Christ in a personal way, if you've trusted in him as your savior, as the one who died on the cross for your sins, then the Spirit of Christ lives within you. And if the Spirit of Christ lives within you, then the kingdom of God has come to you. And you live in the kingdom of God because you're living under the rule of the king. So think about the world that we're living in right now. Think of uh, the chaos, right? Not just even in our country, but really all around the world, and not just even with something like COVID, but in all kinds of humanitarian and governmental and empirical ways. But as followers of Jesus, the kingdom of God is our home. It's where we live. It's the reality that we live in. I just want to remind us of that this morning. Now, we're going to go to Jonah chapter 3. We're going to go to the last half of the book of Jonah, and the chapters are short. So chapter 3 and 4 are going to go quickly. And this is a series we started two weeks ago called Unfinished. This is a theme that the Alliance is using uh, right now through their uh, work with uh, Alliance missionaries around the country, going into Alliance churches and reminding us all that the work of God is unfinished. Now, I want to remind you from two weeks ago what we talked about, that Jonah was a prophet from the middle 700s uh, B.C., and he was from Galilee. He was from the northern ten tribes. He was from Israel. The southern two tribes were called Judah after, they had, uh, after the country had split and divided in the 900s B.C. And Jonah was a prophet in the north, but he wasn't prophesying to the north. He was actually prophesying to Nineveh. And who were the Ninevites to him? What was Nineveh to him? And I said two weeks ago, it would be like what we might consider to be Moscow or Pyongyang. Yet today, we look at the people who live there, and we say they're people just like us. It's really the government and the leadership that is wicked. It's the leadership that's going in the wrong direction. But back then, it wasn't so. Not only were the, were the leaders and the king uh, in Nineveh, the Syrian empire, not only was the leadership 
uh, cruel and unusual, but the people were, the culture was, and they were, they were merciless against their enemies. The Assyrians were known far and wide that if they came in, they would destroy without mercy. They were, they were pretty much, they were bloodthirsty. And God in chapter one tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and to proclaim a message to them. And Jonah runs the other direction. And so here this map, let's look at this map again from two weeks ago, just to remind you that the uh, yellow triangle is where Jonah was, and God called him to go northwest or, or northeast, and instead of going northeast to Nineveh, he actually got on a boat southwest in Joppa, and he headed toward Tarshish. So remember the storm, and remember the fish, um, and now he's going to have to go to Nineveh. Now, if you were to go to modern-day Nineveh, this is what you would see. Again, I showed you these pictures last week. Uh, this is uh, western Mosul, Iraq. It's on the western side of the Tigris River. This is what they call the old city. This is where uh, the Islamic State fighters were embedded in the old city. And just three and a half years ago, when the um, Iraqi army finally got them out of Mosul, there was merciless bombing on top of the bombing that had already taken place. And since then, they've been attempting to rebuild. And there's actually a guy who's called a governor of Nineveh. And he's been working with UNESCO and with other outside organizations, with a consortium of countries in the Middle East who are coming and trying to help Iraq. And yet the money is not being used right, it's being diverted. The guy was kicked out in 2017 and then reinstated again late 2017, finally kicked out for good in early 2019. And they're still working to rebuild the western side of that city. I communicated with a travel blogger who actually visited just three months ago. He visited as a tourist Mosul and of course took a lot of video, uh, which I got to see. And he talks about how the place is just destroyed. And you've got little kids that are climbing on piles of rubble, finding pieces of metal and anything that they can scavenge or salvage or, or, or trade for money. There's a lot of bodies that are still there, jumbled up with all the debris. That is modern day Nineveh. This is the place where Jonah was told to go. It was the most populous and prosperous city of the Assyrian Empire. And this, these were enemies of Jonah's people. And Jonah didn't want to go. So we pick up his story in chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. So remember that he ran, and then the storm, and then the fish, and then the psalm of thanksgiving. And you would think that once the fish vomited him up and he got cleaned up and got back to his senses, that because of the psalm of thanksgiving, that he cried out to God inside the fish, that at this point, he would be a guy of significant faith. If you thought that, you'd be wrong. You would think that the stuff that we go through in life, that after, after the hard stuff, after God kind of carries us through situations, that, that, that we would have stronger faith, you would probably be wrong. It's probably the exception rather than the rule. Over and over again, as you go through the scriptures, you see people going through tremendous suffering, followed by tremendous acts of God to deliver them, only to find themselves in the same place of disbelief afterwards. So just because he was a prophet, Jonah was not a very spiritual guy. Because God always calls unqualified people. He always does. 35 years ago, last month, I heard a message by a guy named Rich Goldsmith. And in the message, he made this statement, and I've never forgotten it in 35 years. He said, God doesn't call the fit, he fits the called. And I was sitting there that day, 
and I said to myself, I'm not fit. I'm not fit. But then he, he said to me, God doesn't call the fit. Oh, well, the God can use me because he fits the called. See, if you feel like you're unqualified, if you feel like you're, you're just not like where, where you need to be for God to use you, you're, you're exactly where you need to be for God to use you because God only has unqualified people to use. And Jonah, even though he's got a book in the Bible, and even though he was a prophet, he was in many ways unqualified. And we're gonna see how God uses him. Verse three, let's follow the text now. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. Another translation would be a very important city, important to God. It took three days to go through it, it was big, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's like the extent of the message that we see. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. Notice that phrase, Nineveh. The Ninevites believed God. You remember the statement about Abraham? Abraham believed God, and after that, it was counted to him as righteousness. The Ninevites believed God. Very significant. Verse 6, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. This city that you could go to today and see the destruction, this is the city where he made this proclamation. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that he will, so that we will not perish. This who knows, an interesting thought. Verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he, has thre he had threatened. Let me just connect a theological thought for you here. In James chapter 2, James says that faith without works is dead, being alone. Here in Jonah chapter 3, we see that the Ninevites believed, and then God saw what they did. Their faith actually resulted in them changing their ways and actually them um, turning from their evil ways. That faith caused them to turn from their evil ways. Because faith is never without action. Inerrant in the definition of faith is the idea of action, a belief that's so strong, it changes not only how we think, but it changes how we live and what we do. Now, chapter four. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. God relented and he didn't bring on them the destruction. And to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. If, if chapter 3 was about Nineveh, chapter 4 is about Jonah. It's about Jonah. And it teaches us that it's not just about what God wants to do through us, but it's what God wants to do in us. Because God wanted to do something through Noah in, in the city of Nineveh, but chapter 4 is all about what God wanted to do in Noah. So you think about the things that God wants you to do. Remember that sometimes God wants you to do those things, not just so that he can work through you, but so that in the doing of those things, God changes you on the inside. God does something in you and in me. Verse 2, he was angry, thought it was very wrong. He prayed to the Lord, an angry prayer. Isn't this what I said, Lord? Now notice Lord, it's all capitalized. This is the word Yahweh. In the previous verses where the king talked about God, he just said God, Elohim. But now 
Jonah is calling on the covenant-keeping God. He prayed to the Lord, to Yahweh, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is why I tried to forestall, this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. I knew you were good. I knew you were loving. Doggone it. I knew you were not going to bring the hammer down on them. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it's better for me to, uh, to die than to live. But the Lord replied, really, Jonah? <laughs> That's what the Lord replied. Really, Jonah? Is it really right for you to be angry? Because I blessed your enemies, you're angry. Is that the way to behave, Jonah? Jonah? Is that the right way? It's kind of a rhetorical question. Verse 5, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Oh, he's so spiritual. What a loving guy. He pops his popcorn, gets his seat ready, and he's waiting for the show. The fire and destruction, the doom and the gloom, the fire and the fury to come down in Nineveh. He wanted that. He saw the Ninevites. He, he had to have seen them change. He had to have seen them respond to his message. They were just waiting for the message. And God had prepared them at just that time for them to change, for them to repent, from their, for them to turn from their evil ways. See, because God looked at a city filled with people and he saw the pain that their evil was bringing on them. And he wanted them to change. And there's Jonah. He sees them starting to change. But before he can see it, the, the finish of it, the cycle complete, he goes outside the city so as not to get burned by the fire that God's going to send. And he sets himself up. He's going to watch the destruction. Really, Jonah? Big prophet nice prophet. That's the guy. That's our guy. That's our, that's our prophet Jonah. Pop some popcorn, watch the show. Man, I can't wait to see my enemy get crushed. You ever feel that way? You're in good company. Honestly, as we look at the, the Old Testament, we're in good company. We're really no different. We're redeemed. We're filled with the Holy Spirit if we've placed our faith in Jesus Christ, in that we're different. But in the flesh, we're people just like they were. And sometimes our faith is not very strong. Verse 6, then the Lord God provided a leafy plant. This is an object lesson for Jonah. He provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. For the first time in the book, Jonah is very happy. But at dawn, the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. He's not very happy anymore. But God said to Jonah, really, Jonah? Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Look what Jonah says. It is. It is, God. It's like a three-year-old, right? Sometimes we're like three-year-olds, but Jonah, for sure, was being like a three-year-old. Yes, God, it is right. It is right for me to be angry. In fact, I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. If we were honest, sometimes we feel the same way. Sometimes we see God doing something or not doing something, and we get angry about it. Sometimes we could even get into despair. I've never been to the point yet where I wish I were dead. I hope I never get to that point. But Jonah was a prophet, and he got to that point. But God still loved him, and God still was long-suffering just like he was to Nineveh, verse 10. But the Lord said, 
You have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and it died overnight. You've been concerned about the plant. Should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people? They can't tell their right hand from their left. They can't. And also many animals. The book of Jonah ends with a question. Just a question. Shouldn't I be concerned, Jonah? Shouldn't I be concerned about this great city? 120,000 people, they can't tell their right hand from their left. And then God says, this is kind of cool, especially if you're an animal lover. And then God says, yeah, and all the animals too. What about all the animals, Jonah? The end. That's the end of the book. Well, what was the answer? What was Jonah's answer? We don't know. Well, how did Jonah end up? We don't know. Did he go back to Israel and rejoice that the Assyrian Empire was returning uh, away from, going away from their evil? We don't know. We don't know. It ends with a question. The question really was for Israel. Israel, are you going to care about your enemies? Are you going to care about the surrounding nations? Are you going to be faithful and obedient so that you can point the surrounding nations to me? Or are you going to be weak and selfish and faithless so that you become like the surrounding nations, essentially shielding them from seeing me? That was the question to Israel. Now, it's interesting that the very last question is basically... Should, should God be concerned with our enemies? God says, should I be? Shouldn't I be concerned with your enemies, Jonah? And it begs the question for us, if God is concerned with our enemies, shouldn't we be concerned with our enemies and for our enemies? Not only just the people around us that are not our enemies, we're supposed to love them, but even our enemies. And then later on, Jesus comes and he says, love your enemies. Love your enemies. That's really, that's really the lesson here way back in Jonah. Jonah, love your enemies. Take the word of God to them. Then don't just sit back and wait for their destruction. And Jesus came and he said, love your enemies. A couple weeks ago, I talked to you about a Christocentric hermeneutic. And so I wrote this in yellow underneath it. It's just a Jesus-centered understanding of the passage. You understand the passage through the person of Jesus. And Jesus helps us with this because, again, he talks about this. He talks about the story of Jonah. And I want to read this to you again. Look at this. And the religious leaders had just declared that Jesus had done what he did, healed a guy by the power of Satan. And then later on, this is what Jesus says in Matthew 12, 39. Jesus answers them, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. They said, Jesus, show us a sign. He said, no, none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Hadn't happened yet, but he was telling them, he was giving them a hint. In Luke, he says, for as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also will the Son of Man be to this generation. Well, that had already happened. The men of Nineveh, Jesus said, will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And he says, and now one greater than Jonah is here. In that passage, he goes on to say that the queen of wherever will stand up in the judgment and condemn them, because she came from afar to seek the wisdom of Solomon. And then Jesus said, now one greater than Solomon is here. Jesus says, I'm here. And it's interesting that Jonah was unqualified Jonah, was actually a type and a picture, a symbolic of Jesus in his three days and three nights in the fish, 
and in his proclamation of good news to Nineveh. Now, I've got um, a few questions for you. Number one, what is unfinished in your life and what work is God doing in you? See, because what God's calling you to do is probably connected with what God wants to do in you. So what's unfinished in your life? And what is God, what work is God doing in you? And I've got, what work is God going in you? It should be doing. Second question, are there people that God is concerned about that he might be sending you to? You to? Are there people that God's concerned about them? And he wants to use you to make a difference in their life. And again, it doesn't have to be a big, huge thing. It could be just you going a little out of your way to letting somebody know they matter and helping them in whatever situation they're in, and thereby bringing the love of God to them. Third question, how do you feel about the Ninevites in your life? And are you concerned for the other? You know, in our society right now, there's a lot of us's and them's. There's a lot of this side and that side. And there's a lot of me, mine, and us, and they, them, and the others. And there's a lot of uh, polarization over all kinds of different things, from the biggest things in, in government to the smallest things in communities, to neighbors putting fences between their properties, in churches dividing and building new buildings and separating and separating, friendships breaking down. And Jonah, the book of Jonah, teaches us to have, to be long-suffering, to be slow to anger, to care about people that aren't like us and even care about our enemies. I've got four things I want you to think about. Number one, approval of behavior versus respect of one made in his image. Sometimes Christians can think, huh, if I'm kind to so-and-so, people might think that I approve of how they are or what they do. When in reality, when we show respect to somebody else made in the image of God, that's pleasing to God. And if they're actually our enemies, then Jesus tells us to love them, to love them. So don't mistake and don't confuse approving somebody's behavior with just respecting somebody made in the image of God. We should do this without necessarily doing this because we don't even approve of some of our own behavior, right? We shouldn't approve of the evil behavior of others, but we should respect all people because they're made in the image of God. And Jonah teaches us that. These themes are going through Jonah. Second thing is antipathy versus celebration. You know, it could be that you're, you're, you're different, you're weird, so I don't like you. Have you ever felt that? I've felt that. I've looked at somebody and think, man, they're weird. They're different. And then if you actually like, get into their living space and you see their culture is different, oh, man, I don't like that. I like my culture. I like things the way... I'm used to them being. I don't like things that are different. So I have an antipathy toward you. I don't like you. Versus celebrating the difference. Celebrating the difference. This reminds me of this book by Scott McKnight. It's called A Fellowship of Difference. And difference is R-E-N-T-S at the end. At the end. Not difference, but difference. We're different. So, if you're different than me, then we're both in the body of Christ. We can celebrate the difference, and we can celebrate the difference between us. It's, it's appreciating variety and diversity. So, there's an appreciation of that. Rather than looking at somebody and say, you're different than me, you're weird, you're odd, I don't like you. Jonah was saying that. He was saying, no, Nineveh, no, they're the enemy. They're bad. I hate them. Don't be nice to them, God. And then apathy versus care for the least of these. So do, do we pass by people uncaring? Do we look and say, 
well, they're different than me. I, they're not part of my tribe. They're not part of my life. I don't need to worry about them. Or do we go out of our way to care for people and especially care for those who Jesus described as the least of those among you in Matthew 25? Then finally, disobedience versus obedience. So Jonah ended with a question. So I'm going to end this message with a question, and then I'm going to pray. And here's the question. Will you love your enemies and care for the least of these, or will you be disobedient? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you said that in the same way Jonah was in the belly of the fish, you would be in the grave. And Jonah proclaimed good news, and God, you sent your son to proclaim good news, to give sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf, to raise the dead and to set the captives free, to heal the sick. God, we know that when you sent your son, that we were all enemies. We were all enemies. Your word says that we were, we were enemies of God. We were not a people, says in the Old Testament. But then Jesus came, and he changed all that. And he made us who were enemies to be the people of God, and he called us friend. God, we see Jonah angry at the end of the book, and we're left hanging. We're left wondering, what became of Jonah? Of what? His heart. Where did his heart end up? We don't know. But God, we can know for us, and I pray that as we, as we see your compassion, your long-suffering, your kindness, your abounding in love to the people of Nineveh, God, I pray that you would give us that same heart. While our society and our culture wants to put us on one side or the other, may we, may, may followers of Jesus, stay in the middle and reach all people. May, may we be the peacemakers. May we be the ones to love not only our friends, but also our enemies. God, I pray that if there's someone listening right now who's never turned to Jesus, who's never looked to the Savior who hung on a cross for their sins, for their own sins in their life, that they would place their faith in Jesus Christ, that they would say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive my sins. I place my faith in you. Change my life. I've been doing it my way and it's not working. Help me to do it your way. Forgive my sins and make me a child of God. Lord, I pray that if there's someone listening to this message who's never placed their faith in Jesus, that they would place their faith in Jesus. He would become their savior. Lord, help us to love you to love our enemies, to love our neighbors. In Jesus' name, amen.